So, hi everybody. My name is Dirk Eibach. Um, I'm a member of Karl Kloos Schweißtechnik, so I will refer to it as Kloos from now on. And a um, few words about me. Um, I was born in the 70s. Uh, I always had a kind of fascination for home computers and electronics. And um, so I studied it and finished as a German diplom engineer in 1997. And my first job was in industrial automation. Later on, I did embedded Linux systems for about 17 years at a, gun, uh, at a company called Guntermann and Grunk in Germany. You may never have heard of them. Uh, they are in the KVM business, not what you think. It's about keyboard, video, mouse, uh, extending, matrix switching, that stuff. If you came in by plane, uh, all the flight control centers uh, like Euro Control and DFS are controlled by them and uh, you were probably guided by one of my kernel drivers. <laughs> and um, yes, I uh, joined uh, close in 2019, uh, the robot controller team, well knowing that they are doing Windows and a proprietary real-time operating system, so I thought I would leave uh, the Linux world for foreseeable time, but things might have changed a little. I'm married, I got three kids. Okay, so what is this talk about? Um, uh, yes, close, uh, as you may have heard or may have not heard, is a manufacturer of industrial robots, so, so one of them is pictured here. And in 2021, we decided to do a study if we could change the situation in our robot controller and yes, port the proprietary in-time real-time operating system from uh, yes, to Linux preempt RT patch. And this is about our experience, what we learned on the way and uh, all the lessons. And I want to share that with you. So, a little bit on history. In robots, uh, quite at close, we are doing robots since 1981. Here we have some yes, nostalgia pictures of, of that. Um, and we are doing in-house designed robot controller hardware and software since uh, 1986. First of all, we were using the PLM program, programming language. Before starting at close, I had never heard of that language. Maybe you have, I don't know. And uh, since 1995, uh, we are uh, using uh, standard PC hardware, so industrial hardened, but at the basic standard PC hardware in our robot controllers, which was the first uh, in robot controller industry, at least as far as I know. Um, some words on the Tenasis in-time real-time operating system. It was originally started by Intel under the name RMX uh, in the 70s. And at that time, if you wanted to sell a processor, you needed some kind of software to support it. And uh, from that it came. Later on, uh, this uh, real-time operating system was acquired by Radiusys and they founded a uh, own company to manage it, and that's Tenasis. So a few words about the status quo, uh, how welding is done at close, how robotics is done at close at the moment. Uh, when I started at close, I really have no clue about welding and welding processes. Today, I still don't have that much of a clue, but at least I know all the stuff I don't know. And um, yes, this picture here is a typical arc welding process, gas shielded. So we have a welding torch, we have wire, we have a drop of metal in the air uh, that is going to um, a weld pool. And uh, this is what you classically think about when you think about arc welding, but there's all kind of other processes. Here we have a tungsten welding process where you have a tungsten needle that isn't consumed in the process, so you have to add wire externally. We also support laser welding processes, so the laser itself can be welding, or uh, the laser is heating the workpiece so that the arc welding itself works better. Yes, we also support cutting processes and grinding processes. And um, yes, I, I have brought a video 
maybe uh, that's interesting for you. I hope so. It's uh, taken with a high-speed camera. Uh, I really have no clue with what kind of precision these uh, welding sources are working. So we see we have a pulsed arc and we also uh, have the wire itself is uh, moved in the process to create a short circuit and later on it's pulled back again and this is really really a precise process it's high speed camera as i said this is not real time and um, yes it's uh, we can basically control every drop of molten metal that goes into the weld pool so it's really an amazing technology and i always enjoy having a look over the shoulder of the welding uh, source uh, developers. It's very, very interesting. Okay, so let's finish it. So what is inside one of our robot controllers? Here we have a picture of the cabinet and inside it's not that much. It's quite simple basically. We have our own in-house built industrial PC uh, that has an also in-house developed um, PCI card uh, that has some 24 volt digital IOs, some analog IOs, some CAN buses and um, the communication to the servo drives is done using the EtherCAD real-time bus. Maybe some of you are familiar with that. And um, all the servo drives are EtherCAD slaves connected to that bus. In such a cabinet, uh, we can control up to 32 axes. Uh, and uh, so a few words on our real-time requirements, what we are talking about here. The axes are running in a mode called cyclic synchronous position. So what does that mean? That means we have a bus clock that might be in our case, something like one millisecond or four milliseconds. And each bus cycle, we have to provide a new target position for every servo axis. If that fails, uh, we are in trouble. And the axis starts stuttering and uh, everything goes down the drain, basically. That's, that really must not happen. Um, our motion planner can not do that in one to four milliseconds we need a little more time to calculate positions for all the axes so the uh, motion planner is uh, running at a lower clock typically eight milliseconds or if we have really this full 32 axis might even be 16 milliseconds and in between these clock cycles we interpolate the position so we have a new position for each axis every clock cycle there's some more stuff that's going on in real time to help the axis uh, controller. We calculate the torque for each axis that is to be expected in the next bus cycle uh, using um, the dynamic model of the robot. This is also done in the motion planner. And uh, we also adapt the speed controller depending if we have a light tool or a heavy tool in uh, installed on the robot so um, that the access servo controller can do its work properly. We also have some sensors that uh, can be used in the process uh, to compensate variations tolerances in the workpiece and also that has to be considered in real time. So our code base. It's about three million lines of source code so there's not only motion planning there's also know how about the welding sources. There's all kind of stuff included. It was originally written in PLM, as I told you. Some of it was converted to C and some of that code is still actually present in our code base. And yes, the really ugly part is we have to be still compatible to ANSI C. Um, I don't know if everybody is familiar with that and what that means. Uh, it basically means uh, this part of C is not fun. And um, yes, the application itself is split in different processes that communicate with each other using shared memory and semaphores and mailboxes, all, all kind of stuff. Um, the graphical user interface was originally done with Microsoft Foundation classes because the in-time real-time operation system is tightly coupled 
with Windows for graphical user interfaces. Later on, it was uh, it, we uh, designed a new graphical user interface based on Qt, so uh, that should possibly help porting this to Linux. And it's uh, still not feature complete, so for some things we still have to switch to the old graphical user interface, but uh, I think we are, we are close to 100%. Yeah, the code base itself also has some te technical, uh, technical depth, as you uh, may think. It's from the, it started in the 80s, uh, s things have added up, there were some management decisions that put features over maintenance and altogether we have collected some technical depth. Uh, there's also some knowledge in this code base from developers that have left the company. And uh, we also have to support the legacy system, as I told you. So uh, the only way to do, uh, to handle this is carefully refactoring the stuff. And uh, this can only be done little by little. And starting from zero is not an option for us. And yes. Some words about the Tenacious Intime Artos. It runs a separate kernel on the on the industrial PC. It's uh, it's um, coupled to one uh, dedicated to one uh, to one core of the processor, and uh, the, all the other cores uh, can run the graphical user interface. Um, the graphical user interface can communicate with the real-time processes using an API called. NTX, whatever that means. I'm, I'm not sure what the NTX abbreviation means. Uh, yes, a little diagram. So, oops, sorry. So, uh, if a Windows process wants to communicate with a real-time process, it has to do a call to the NTX library. That goes to a special uh, Windows kernel driver that communicates with the real-time kernel from in time and this again talks to the real-time process. However, however, that kind of magic works. I'm not sure. It's not open source, so I cannot tell, but it works. So we got a tempting offer in two 2021. Uh, we talked to Keba, which is an automation supplier and uh, from Austria, and uh, they have a product, product called Keba D3 which is an automatic automation controller that is running Linux internally. It's a Debian Linux, 32-bit uh, sadly, uh, but with preempt RT kernel attached. And uh, the very important part is it has an integrated safety solution. So safety is a critical component for us because we have industrial robots. And uh, if you want to teach this robot, you have to stand next to this robot which uh, really should not go wrong. And uh, to make sure it doesn't go wrong, you need uh, some kind of safety controller that is, for example, checking that the robot is not exceeding 250 millimeters per second uh, speed. Uh, so you are safe uh, to stand next to it and um, can work with it. So um, at the moment we have an in-house designed solution for that, but uh, the standards are changing, the requirements are getting harder, and we cannot do it with, with our solution anymore. And um, the Keba solution is um, suitable for robotics, for our requirements. So um, this is really important for us. And uh, the flex core label means you can run your own Linux real-time application besides the Keba applications on that controller without many limitations. So you, you can a uh, lot of dangerous stuff, but you can also do a lot of good stuff. Uh, you just have to know what you're doing. So what are the benefits for us? The safety problem is solved. Uh, that's an important part. We can use some off-the-shelf hardware. So um, uh, we don't have to do it on our own anymore. And um, yes, the alternative uh, to the flex core approach would have been we would use our Windows PC within time and communicate uh, to the Keba D3 controller via Ethercad and we would have to act as an Ethercad slave and lots of communication would be required and uh, all this uh, isn't needed if we are running uh, on the system itself. 
and we are also getting rid of some license fees. We don't need a uh, Windows license anymore, we don't need the intern license, we don't need the Ethercad master license, so it's quite attractive for us. Yeah, but how could we find out if that would actually work for us? If it would be possible at all to port our software to Linux? And um, yes, maybe that can be evaluated, ev evaluated theoretically. I'm not sure how to do that, uh, so I came up with another approach. Um, I decided uh, it would be a good idea to do a study. So I suggested that in a meeting and uh, I told the team, uh, what do you think? We could do a study and uh, for six weeks all the real time and the graphical user interface folks would see how far can we get in porting our um, our system to Linux and uh, I was really amazed that everybody agreed that was uh, really nice and uh, so we decided to start that. One more uh, but how uh, how do you do that with a team of Windows developers? Um, so first of all it's important to see who these people are. These are people with decades of experience uh, in the robot and welding industry and uh, they know their Windows stuff, they know their real-time operating stuff and uh, you have to really honor that. And uh, simply saying, okay, we are doing Linux now and everybody should be, um, uh, should really join that uh, wouldn't probably work. It would probably break the motivation for all the team. So, um, we decided that everybody is involved in the decision-making process and um, we really wanted to make sure that this process or, or what comes out of this process is open. Uh, the decision wasn't, wasn't made how to proceed when they started this. Yeah, uh, one thing I thought about was uh, how can we make people comfortable with this? Uh, I mean, you have to consider for all these developers, it's a whole new world using Linux and uh, how uh, could, we, could they make themselves familiar? First of all, you need some time, obviously, to, to look into all this. What does it mean? How does it work? And it's important to give support. So I have some experience on that and uh, yes, I really looked into the problems that popped up uh, and um, it's also important, don't make fun of anyone, there are no stupid questions, the, it's all new for them. And um, it's also impor uh, important to uh, join the fun when some progress happens and something good. And uh, it was also important to create an environment that's comfortable. This doesn't mean uh, free drinks and couches or something like that, so, but this means uh, we have Visual Studio as a development environment that uh, the team is comfortable with and uh, actually you can do Linux uh, development using Visual Studio so we also had a look what can be done there. So some words on the methodology. Mm. Where could we get help in the process? Uh, first of all, there's an excellent book. If you do some system level uh, development, it's really highly recommended. Probably you all have it in your bookshelf. And um, there's also some uh, really good support on the Tenasis website. There are all the API is documented. And there's also a very knowledgeable colleague, Axel Scholz, uh, who was in, in the process. and. He has a lot of knowledge uh, since the 80s. He was in uh, the in-time development uh, of our system and uh, all the stuff that isn't on this website was in his head and so we did the API implementation together and yeah, that worked really well. We, we did some kind of pair programming together and it was quite some fun for us. So what was the concept? Well, just a moment. Need some water. So how did we approach it? Mm -hmm. We decided to implement uh, the InTime API as a user space library, so no kernel coding required there. And um, 
Yes, we will have to support building our in-time application for the future. We still must add features there, so um, we wanted to be able to build our application still from the same code base for in-time and for Linux. Uh, so um, we decided to emulate the in-time API. And uh, at least for the study, we decided to only implement the parts of the in-time API that are really used by us. And even in this talk, I can only cover a very small subset of what we did. There's really a lot of API functions that we implemented. And um, yes, to get started, uh, we threw our source code uh, to GCC and um, had to adapt some things in the in-time header files, first of all, because some of the types that Visual Studio understands are not understood by GCC, and uh, that was a little work. And after that, the application compiled and uh, the linker started spitting out all uh, the unresolved dependencies and uh, yeah, that very uh, API functions we had to implement and uh, we started doing that and used um, a virtual machine, 32-bit, to be as close as possible uh, to the FlexCore environment and um, at the same time the graphical user interface people started uh, porting their project files to CMake, which is required for uh, Visual Studio Linux support. And they also started uh, to remove uh, most of the Windows uh, dependencies that are still um, pending in our libraries uh, and have to be removed for the process. So the... oh. I think I skipped a bit. Um, the, um, the library is called GreenTime, which is the generic re-implementation of the InTime API. And um, yes, this is our real-time application. As you know now, it's uh, linked to libgreenTime, and we also need some, run some runtime support, which is the GreenTime daemon. Um, and one important thing to get right are objects and object directories. So what are objects in InTime? Every resource, like for example, a process, a thread, a semaphore, a mailbox, whatever you can think of, is an InTime object. And uh, these objects get 16-bit unique IDs. Yes, it's 16-bit really, so we can only have 64K uh, objects in, in time, and then we are done. So <laughs> that's interesting, but that's the way it is. And the object directory is a per process key values there, there you can give names to the objects. So uh, you can uh, store the name as a key and uh, the, the handle is a value. And um, you can use that for inter-process communication because any process can, you can look into uh, the object directory of any other process and um, so you can get the objects from another process for inter-process communication. This is how it works in InTime. So how do we do this in Linux? First of all, we had to implement some... Uh, this is the API for that. Uh, so we have a catalog function that needs the process as a parameter, uh, the handle and the name. So that's the way you write into this uh, object directory for looking up, it's similar. And you see uh, the last parameter is in milliseconds, so this is a timeout. Looking up um, things in the object directory cannot be done in real time, so we don't have to do that in Linux either. Um, the array of objects, so 64k objects, if you remember, is uh, stored in a shared memory and each uh, green time application, first of all, has to map this memory to uh, access objects and every object that is created or is deleted is registered in this array and um, uh, each process has to set this up properly. 
and looking up things in this array can be done in real time. So if you have the 16-bit object idea, you can, the, you can get the object in real time. That's, that's all right, no problem. And uh, this is how we implemented the objects. Um, it's a structure. You have a flag if the entry in the 64K array is enabled or not. We have a union with um, data that is specific to each of uh, our object types that we support. And uh, we have, yes, an entry, what kind of object is stored in that entry. Mm. The object itself is uh, implemented as a C++ STR map. Uh, we use the process ID and uh, the name string as a, as a key and the value is the object ID. Um, to get started quickly, we decided to, that, to do that in gRPC and uh, the service is running in the green time daemon that I showed previously. And um, yes, as there are no real-time requirements, that is pretty much all right. And you can also use the, stan the standard gRPC tools to write your own applications, for example, for dumping this kind of object directories for debugging purposes. Um, the process API is also, um, yes, quite, uh, quite few functions uh, and um, something that is really important to understand is the main function. We implemented a standard main function in libgrintime, so every, everything you need is done there. We uh, set up scheduling and priority and uh, signal handlers, memory allocator, all kind of stuff in this main function that is automatically there and then you link libgrintime to your application. But the question is what happens with your original main function that is still there? So uh, we did a trick. Uh, we used the minus D compiler flag to remain this function to main grin time and that is called later uh, from the main function from libgrintime. And uh, this is some kind of a hack, I know, but I really have no idea uh, how to do this uh, better. Um, to hook up in the startup process of a process, uh, maybe you have some ideas. Uh, you're very welcome to talk about that later. Yes, uh, that's the thread API. That's also yes, easily implemented, just a lot of work. More interesting is this part, suspending and resuming individual threads. This is something that I did not find in uh, the Linux API. I'm not sure if there's something. Talk to me later, please. So we had to think about how to implement that. And um, we implemented this as, as per thread signal handlers. and. Uh, the signal handler is uh, basically going to a pause if it gets a SIG USR1 and uh, if a SIG USR2 is sent, it uh, resumes. Um, and uh, we used the TG kill syscall to send this per thread functions. Um, yes, I'm a little scared because TG kill is not in glibc. Maybe there's a reason for that. <laughs> if you know, tell me. <laughs> um, yeah, also a trivial problem. In-time thread priorities are pretty much different from Linux uh, real-time scheduler priorities. Uh, we've solved that uh, with a lookup table, so that has to be configured for every application. Mm. Yes, now <laughs> a more interesting topic. It's memory and if you have a look at this API, especially have a look at this functions, uh, you may realize uh, that this is getting some more fun. Um, yes, but another topic first, every memory that you allocate using malloc can al also be used as shared memory in end time. This cannot be easily done with POSIX shared memory or at least I don't know how to do that. And also we must be able um, to, uh, to deliver object IDs uh, for all allocated memories. So we must keep track of every memory allocation that we do. 
So we decided we need uh, some more powerful allocator for that and writing a custom allocator was not really an option, at least not in six weeks. So I remembered that DLmalloc has some nice features and in fact you can configure DLmalloc uh, to use AMAP for all application, uh, for all allocations and you can also supply a custom AMAP function and um, so you can easily keep track. Uh, so this is part of our custom MAP functions. Uh, so we have a common shared memory file and uh, we get a size requirement that we have to page align so it works with MAP properly. And um, that's it. And then we keep track of all allocations that are done and uh, can use that later uh, to share memory or um, to get an object ID for memory. But um, yes, there's another point in the API as I pointed out earlier. There's a, there are functions to map physical uh, memory which is uh, yes, uh, not that easy in Linux user space um, and uh, I was really horrified when this function popped up in the um, unresolved um, dependencies from the linker. And um, yes, what was done in the application was um, someone doing IPC uh, had a structure and he took the uh, physical address of that structure, communicated it to another process and uh, mapped the physical address of this uh, structure there. So. Um, Yes, that's uh, an interesting decision and uh, first of all we thought, okay, we must do this and uh, we implemented the map uh, RT physical memory uh, function using the proc page map file and uh, trying to use dev mem for that and uh, it kind of worked, but uh, it's not fun. And uh, later on we decided that uh, doing this uh, was a bad design decision originally and this was some part where we really fixed the application and changed that. So what have we achieved in six weeks? First of all, good, good stuff. The Tenesis in time Hello World example is working properly. That's nice. We also managed to um, get our real time, main real time application starting up and doing communication, inter-process inter communication with each other. All the, uh, all the API functions we need are implemented. So there's some, some stuff present already. At the graphical user interface side, we didn't come quite that far. We ported all the projects to CMake. We have removed a lot of dependencies, but yes, we didn't manage to get the graphical user interface working. So um, not a full success, but that was really not expected to achieve in six weeks, but we really got a feeling for the system and we are thinking we can achieve the rest too. So what have we learned? First, I think personally doing a study was the right approach. Uh, we learned a lot, we achieved a lot and um, we are quite sure now we can do it. Uh, Another comment from me, porting an RTOS API can get very addictive. It's fun. Each function you implement and that is working is a success and I've really spent a lot of time there. It's, it's fun, but be warned, uh, you easily get sucked into this. Another thing uh, is if you pay respect to the people on your team, you can achieve amazing things. And um, kudos to Microsoft, they have really done an amazing job. Uh, for making uh, Visual Studio suitable for Linux development. That's really nice. It's still got some rough edges, but it, it works really nicely. So you can connect it via SSH to your virtual machine. The compiler runs on the virtual machine. It's all transparent to the developer. You get your uh, build messages there and um, um, you can also run GDB transparently from the Microsoft Visual Studio debugger and uh, yes, it's all perfect for, for, uh, for our guys who are doing uh, Visual Studio and uh, they can really use it. So um, 
what are the consequences. Uh, after doing the study, we did a vote. And um, I abstained from voting, and all the Windows developers voted. And after all, everybody voted for continuing with the Linux slash FlexCore approach. So um, something must have worked right. Um, but after doing our study, the com component crisis hit. And um, yes, that was bad for us. So the next year we had to do hardware support for replacement components and stuff. Uh, so we couldn't continue uh, with our uh, with our intern port, and uh, that's a little sad. So this uh, still will have to wait. I hope we will continue this year. We also decided that GrinTime um, will be open sourced. Uh, I don't know if anybody of you is involved in the in time business, but if so, please uh, come to me, talk to me. If you're interested in the code, uh, yes, you can follow on github.com slash grintime. It's not there yet because I have to remove uh, some things from our Git repository that are tenacious uh, in-time header files. We cannot deliver those, uh, uh, obviously, but um, after cleaning that up, uh, I will post it there and uh, you can have a look. So, questions? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, v very nice story. Um, reminded me a lot of what, what we've been through and what we're looking to in the past. Um, did you happen to have a look at regarding implementation how um, the Artos layer, uh, the Artos emulation layer of Xenomai was solving some of the tasks as well for other APIs? Uh, we don't have an in time API there, but we have it for BXWorks and other stuff. So, a lot of things sounds very familiar to me. Yes. And maybe that could have been a source for, or maybe it was a source of inspiration, or maybe even of source code for emulating certain elements of that. I, I had a look at uh, Senomai, and uh, I, I used it a few years ago in a different project. And um, uh, yes, it's uh, another approach. But um, as we are using this Keba controller, we don't have much much room for doing uh, for doing other stuff. Uh, so uh, we wanted to be as close to um, standard Linux as, as possible. Yeah, but, but you know that there's also a Mercury there's version of it, which is standard Linux. Yes, yes, I know okay. of that. But uh, we decided uh, to, to only use um, the yeah, Linux programming interface for that. A very short uh, remark about the shared memory. If ever, uh, anybody is struggling with this, boost shared memory is a good way to go. Boost shared memory, yeah. okay. Didn't have a look at this yet. Uh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> and the other thing you want to know is um, constructors. Look at uh, constructor functions. This is what basically a trick you can avoid overloading the main function. Constructors. Okay, yeah. yes, I Easy think I remember I had some experiments with that, but uh, yeah, maybe I should have it continued with it. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any other questions? No? No? Okay. Thank you.